Hello. I, yeah, I'm going to record this one. I didn't record the first session. Uh, first session, I went a little long, but nobody seemed to have questions anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, so I guess I'll, well, I actually forgot to take attendance last class, so I'll, um, do that real quick. Does anybody have questions on, uh, is anybody going to have questions for project one? Should I leave time at the end of class for some uh, work time? I think I'm going to anyway, but. Everybody's just doing so great. They don't need any help. Bernard thinks he can help me. Alex, Alyssa, Calvin. So, Calvin. I wish there was a way I could like organize participants by like name, that'd be nice. Nerd gift, Jackie. Michael Nate Nick. So just no Brett, right? Okay, we're only missing one. Um, <clears throat> so I'm behind on the on the uh, everything. I'm behind on life. <laughs> no. Um, here we go. So. I mentioned before I was going through an updating schedule. Didn't finalize it still because apparently I just keep putting it off. However, I'm at the point where I have to update it after class today. So um, I'll update it like into the next month and then I'll uh, should be done by this evening, but I'll probably send out a reminder. Um, the next day or two so you guys can ensure that you check back in make sure you see what's going on um, however a couple of updates um, and this is just due to my inability at following my own directions um, so there's a specific way I like to introduce each section and the way, you know, I have to account for um, like how much time we have in class and how much time we have between classes. Like I don't want to, you know, on next Monday assign you guys to come up with a concept and all your sketches and then just have like two days, you know, to do that. Uh, it's feels more constrained. So normally I like to have you do that over a weekend, which come to find out that <clears throat> that's how I want to do it this time as well. So 
oh, excuse me. Um, so Monday, there, there's nothing really due. Um, I'm pushing project one to be um, due next Wednesday. It's not necessarily like an oh yay moment because I'm also um, assigning you guys to have your sketches done by that Wednesday. So I'm giving you more time for one thing, but I'm adding something that wasn't necessarily on there to begin with. So um, probably end class a few minutes early today. So if anybody has questions, project one, um, stick around for that. However, you'll be watching uh, the second video, Helvetica, which is linked down here um, over the weekend. And I'll probably have you guys um, do a blog post, which the blog, no, blog post. Uh, the blog question isn't even on there as of right the second. So got a couple of things to catch up on. Um, I did a bunch of things in my office hour today, but I didn't realize you know, the schedule was all, all shit still. Um, yeah, I'm just giving you guys some insight. Uh, last semester, I reorganized the whole, you know, half the course's content to be at different times so that we have the coding portion completed by the time media study has their open, their student show thing, right? I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the student show, uh, media studies student show thing. And so I rearranged the whole course, which takes time to go into the schedule and move everything and, and relink stuff and blah, blah. I, I changed all the names of all the project, you know, project two is now project four and, blah, 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 and all the linking changed and blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I kind of redid the schedule but I didn't redo all that other, you know, back end stuff. So um, just, I guess, spaced on the fact that, oh, I have more prep work than I thought I did. So a um, little behind on the eight balls all. Um, I don't even know what that expression means, but I used it. So um, probably have you guys do that like, post or um, response to video two by like Friday night. Um, then you have the weekend and I'll have like your project proposal due Sunday night probably. And then <clears throat> I would also probably start doing sketches. Um, same structure as the last project, the same amount, the same style. Um, and we're going to be going over the project, you know, requirements, or at least um, what the project is. And um, get a head start on the sketches, you know, like do some thumbnails kind of thing um, while your ideas are still fresh from like the video and. Um, um, I'm going to be going over some some different art uh, art and design movements today in a lecture. So hopefully some of that will be interesting enough for you guys to also uh, consider looking up more of that content if you're you know, if you're interested in it. Um, a note on that content, <clears throat> just like I was saying for Project One. That you guys can utilize like scans or, or you know you should be I think I, I think I made it a requirement just for uh, just for you guys to double check you should have had a photo or like a scan in your project pretty sure that's a thing um, so similar to that this project too um, thinking about like where are you sourcing your content from we're Kind of transitioning into more of like a, a headspace project, more more layers of um, structuring, right? Which is like this design sense of design that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be rambling about, and 
when I go over these different like topics of different eras of art, I guess those individually could even be their own sources of like how you're referencing referencing content or building content um, as different structures to harness. So <clears throat> the first project was much more loose in the sense of like, oh, I'm gonna apply this filter and smear everything. And oh yeah, it looks cool. Oh, let's throw this other thing over top. And yeah, you know, kind of playing around, goofing around, seeing what you could do, but really also making sure you understand uses of tools well. Um, this is a good time to reflect like, at the point you're at, have you used as even as many tools as we did in our exercise, right? If not, if you're struggling kind of still, probably a good idea to meet with me, you know, briefly at the end of the class. Um, so yeah, and then Monday we're going to be doing the uh, illustrator exercise, diving in and starting that. So. I know it's a little weird because uh, it's not all updated and I, I apologize. Um, you know, the beginning of the semester is like a month ahead and I, it's how I usually like to keep it. So um, I don't know what it is this semester. Just like assuming that I have everything ready, but I don't. Um, yeah, so things you just have to make sure you're doing is like watch this movie and uh, get a response by Friday. And I should probably have, I should be emailing you, you know, probably tomorrow or Friday afternoon. As a reminder, like everything's updated and make sure you do this stuff for the weekend. Um, it's the least I can do since I didn't follow through with the schedule updates. What to do first? Oh, um, this, I wanted to mention this canopy link. Uh, this is a service that our UB library subscribes to. So as a student, you should have full access. And a lot of the stuff's pretty sweet. Um, I forget about it from time to time, but um, you have to just sign in and it'll ask you to like, you know, log in, whatever. You don't wanna just put in your email and, and password for UB. There's actually, there should be like, a, the first time you come in here, um, let's see if I go to log in and see, it looks like this email address is invalid. Um, on that previous link, you guys should get a, um, login with, uh, now it's not coming up for me. Oh, cause I'm already like, I'm like softly logged in. Cause I already say, said, um, save my login info, but somewhere on like the overlay of the video, it should say log in with your university credentials and then you should be fine. Um, yeah. So it's better than renting this because it's the only way you see it otherwise. Um, and to pair with the lecture, I'm going to be going over here. Um, keep in mind that the next vocab is here. So, you know, if you have a printer, I always like printing, um, content faculty give me, cause then I could like, I don't know, something about having something in your hand. I never got the whole Kindle thing. I like to be able to like highlight or circle or whatever. Uh, I think the vocab link is broken. Could be, but I just think I just clicked it. Hmm, weird. Oh, the no, left, there it goes. The left side worked and the right side didn't work? Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's weird. Well, that's just rude. Yeah, that's that's uh, some of the stuff I was doing in my office hour. Uh, the left side is linked to the fall 20 PDF. The right side is linked to the spring 20 PDF. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Well, it's actually not the spring one. I 
didn't name the, the fall one correctly the first time. So um, I went back and changed it. I didn't realize I only changed half of it. Weird. Oh, and uh, I've been kind of like pointing at the screen while I'm talking and didn't realize I'm not screen sharing, so that's cool. Vocab to fall, boom. Fly. Okay, that's uh, that's live now. Man, so you guys just had to look at my face the whole time? Ew. Share screen. Oh, God. Now you just have to deal with my voice. So much better. <laughs> Um, yepa, 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 yepa. Um, oh, this is one thing I just um, put a link on the project page. Uh, for anybody that has, I, I'm, um, I don't know if you guys are Apple enough to hear that Apple is going to be doing a bundle subscription thing called Apple One. It's going to be like a crazy good value um, to, to drink their Kool-Aid, become one with the ecosystem. Um, I'm, I'm managing um, my family's like phone plan line. So I'm currently like, oh, what other services can we package and save money? Anyway, um, Apple News is one of the services offered by Apple that they offer a free month trial. And a lot of people probably haven't done that yet. You know, like if you're a normal everyday college student, maybe not. So if you haven't taken advantage of that, uh, this could be a good time because a lot of, um, you know, newspaper kind of, or newspapers, but um, like design magazines um, are on there. And the one I'm really, uh, that I really love, I, I subscribe to for a number of years, is Wired Magazine. And so rather than buying stuff or going to the library, like, um, mind you though, the library does have a lot of this, like magazines on file, right? Um, so rather than doing all that, you could get it all on your, you know, MacBook or um, iPad or something. And there's tons of uses of type. Right, so um, it's it's a good resource to be looking into. I just thought I'd mention. And let me get rid of some of these windows. So I can think. <clears throat> yeah, so just a refresher on, um, I feel like I'm, excuse me, uh, just as a refresher for my keynotes here, when you do open them up, uh, you really only have access to viewing them, which is like all I really want you to do if you open it up during class. I mean, I'm going to be screen sharing it, so I don't really need two of them going, but on your own, if you're reviewing this, if you miss class, whatever, and you need to go back in and see what we covered, uh, this top left option, choose what you want to show or hide. This will allow you to have presenter notes. Stuff. Right, and then uh, it'll be there. Then you can read and stuff. But um, yeah, for like normal normal class meetings, uh, just probably better to leave it off so you can just focus and listen. Um, I, I ramble a lot anyway, so it won't go super in sync. So let me play this. And get my 
other screen up to par here. All right. Okie doke. So the one big thing that I want to preface here before we start this is um, the different components of this new section that we're going to be diving into. Obviously, vector art, right? We already covered raster-based art. And this is going to be transitioning into a different format. We will also be focusing on the content of typography, which is the study of type and the use of type. And alongside of those is a third category, design. And design doesn't usually get the credit that it deserves. Normally it's just tossed in um, such as this, right? This is uh, one of four sections of this course and it's one of three components of this section. Um, however, there are is whole schools that focus on strictly just design, right? So, and like, what is design? We're gonna be covering that. Um, my undergrad, it was the School of Art and Design. So literally taking that sense of, um, you know, fostering and developing within that sphere of influence rather than, um, you know. So we're gonna be talking a little bit of like why design matters and um, what you guys should be focusing on as well. And what's the other one thing I wanted to preface? Oh, let me go back so you can get a visual. So this image here of like, um, these are, I updated this, I didn't update the first project. The banner here is DMS student projects for this. Um, and they're all interesting in their own ways. I wouldn't say any of them are like, you know, out of like nail, like they were knocked out of the park so amazing based on like, you know, um, exactly what the project is kind of uh, requiring. There are some other examples from the art department that um, I'd say are more so like that immaculate status. Um, and it's just partly due to that factor that you guys really haven't focused on design, I would assume. Like design is not really a thing in this department more so than it is in the art department. So the one thing that I'm trying to break you guys out of is that is that um, notion of like um, creating things that just look good you know like pictorially oh it's pleasing to look at i want you to be focusing on this project how things are read literally using type and words and focusing on using that type and words so this is probably the, the biggest example, right? Because we look at those letter forms first, right? And through the, through the letters, there's some kind of symbolism with the colors. However, it's not much more different than just like using type that's on a curve, you know? Uh, it has been chopped up and divided and colored and whatever, and there's effects. Um, but it's not like, I guess in here as well, right? We could all understand this is like a cookie and this head is like a glass of milk and you could see like milk splashing out. It's not really milk, psych, it's words. So it's thinking in that different way. Um, what is the underlying structure that we're trying to use here? And I could tell you that it's not pictorial content. It's not like this, the main component of this is a background of a woman, right? N not forefronting with type. There's type overlaid on top of it, like layout design, like you'd see in a magazine, but not necessarily like altering the letter forms to create something new, right? And and crafting those letters into like an object that speaks for itself. And so 
that's, I guess, the goal of this section is to kind of utilize these diff different design principles within the sphere of typography um, to create this vector artwork. And uh, I think that's a pretty good double down preface. Pre prefacing? I don't know, words, man. Sometimes. Okay, onward. So here's that follow up example. And from the first, you know, first um, lecture, I believe I gave you guys an example, maybe I didn't, a raster vector. And here we could see two different images. I literally took a screenshot uh, from somewhere online of Peter's head. I brought that into Photoshop on the right and I enlarged it, right? I changed the scale of the image and therefore it pixelized it, made it blurry because you can't have, you can't have a program create pixels where there aren't any. Um, that deals, that deals, or that de delves, it delves into the realm of like uh, AI. I think a lot of you have probably been seeing some of that kind of stuff coming out. Like you can go on YouTube and find um, like 1920s black and white footage of people walking around New York, but they've ran it through an algorithm to remove the judder, remove the shakiness, remove the artifacts, and like put in frames where there were none, right? So kind of filling the void, so to speak. And that's becoming more and more of a thing through com like computer learning. Um, but traditionally, uh, you cannot do it, you know, you or I with the tools that we have thus far. Whereas the vector program, or vector, you know, uh, files that deal with vectors, programs that deal with vectors, this is the same image that I brought into Illustrator and I first vectorized it, meaning I transformed it from pixels into vector points, which you can see some of the vector points here. And that process of vectorizing, um, you have a plethora of um, presets that you can do to alter the way in which it does do that digit, uh, the, the vectorization. And so for this example, I wanted to be very cartoony, right? Cause it's a cartoon. I didn't want it to have, you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, weird detail that could be found in there. I wanted to smooth that out, which it did. And so the, the plus side about vectors then is once you transform it into these plotted points on a grid, you can scale that to whatever size you want. And realistically, you're only moving those points. The points are expanding out on the grid. It's still being like filled with the same color, the same gradient, whatever, whatever the map has to happen. It's not individual pixels that are being colored. It's a space and the space is predetermined. So just like you move your mouse up, up, down, left, right, that's on a grid. The computer knows where your pointer is at. Same thing with these points. And so if you zoom out, right, if you look at the little, the little thumbnails up here in the top left, they look identical, right? You, you wouldn't be able to tell they're different because you're shrinking. And when you shrink, you're removing content. You're not necessarily pixelizing anything. You're just making it smaller. So when you do enlarge it, that's when you get that pixelization, right? So it's really, it's really um, using vectors as a way to avoid that process. And it's really your decision as a creator to decide, well, what am I making this content for? What purposes does this content have to serve? And from that point on, you can decide, well, am I gonna use vector or am I gonna use raster? Um, 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 um. 
I call myself out on the ums. So mathematical points, blah, blah, blah. Um, the big point, big ticket here is these are not resolution dependent. They are resolution independent. It's a, it's a key factor and you guys, might be surprised. I don't know if, how many of you are focusing right now. Um, I don't know if it's a matter of like, you guys are like, yeah, I get it. And then you just forget. Or if everybody's just like nodding their head in like la la land. Not really like, oh yeah, this is what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I have ways of knowing if you know and a lot of people end up not knowing somehow. So again, vector art is resolution Any, anybody? Vector vector images, vector art. Is it Resolution independent. independent. Yeah, it's not dependent on pixels. Totally. Okay, moving on. Here's just a grid of some like pros and cons, um, or maybe all pros. I don't, I don't know, no, pros and cons. Uh, the biggest thing you'll notice is that the file size is going to be much smaller for the uh, Illustrator file, like a fraction smaller. Um, you usually will see vector stuff done for more simplistic types of things, like um, really kind of like that cartoon aesthetic. Um, I'm not a cartoonist, or not, nor have I spoken with one, so I don't really know if people create vector work for cartoons these days. Um, I even taught last semester an uh, animation course, and I, ne I never stumbled upon that info. So once people get things to the computer, uh, I'm not sure if, you know, if what the, what the process is. I guess it just, just depends on workflow. Um, but yeah, again, the benefit is, is if you create stuff in vector, you could always scale it up, right? Um, so say if, if somebody designed the original Simpsons cartoon, all those original first few se uh, seasons, if they designed all of that by just hand, like, you know, hand drawing or like computer drawing, or it probably couldn't have been computer drawing, um, and they don't have the original drawings anymore. It's all just like the footage or whatever. How are you filling those voids when you expand it to 4K? Versus if you have it all as vector points and you have it very small and, you know, 100 years from now, we can put a projector on the moon and watch it from there, from here. It's a really dumb example, but... <laughs> Um, I think that's all I want to say for that. Resolution dependency. So another image took it, vectorized it. And as we zoom in, what do we notice? It's not dependent on resolution. Whoa. Totally just scales evenly. So like if you were to make something for a billboard, the other thing I meant, did not mention is that this type of content is really well suited for logos, right? Designing content that needs that flexibility. So say, this is the example I gave last class. Say somebody wants you to make them a logo but you never really cared to use Illustrator. 
you like Photoshop more and like, Oh yeah, I'll make them a logo, charge them a hundred bucks, spend a few hours. You give it to them. They're like, Oh, great. Thanks. And it's like, they have a lawn mowing service or something, you know, I don't know what carpentry, whatever. Um, they use it as a business card. Right. And then they go to use that. They're getting better. They have more people contacting them and they want to know, they want to have like stuff on the web so that they don't have to talk to people so much. Well, then you need a website. And then if you put that logo on the website, you have to expand it probably a little bit. So it's a little bit bigger, maybe, right? I don't know. You have a larger spot on the website for your logo. And it's going to be a little blurry maybe because you used uh, pixels. But it could be fine. They might not care too much. They're like, oh, well, whatever. It's on there. It's, it's not so great, but it does what it needs to do. They don't know how to fix it. So whatever. It's going to have to work, right? That's what most people would say. Well, it's, it's on there. It's fine. Well, what happens if they keep expanding? They keep becoming better. And all of a sudden, they need, you know, T-shirts printed or a logo for the side of their vehicle or um, a sign for in front of the business. It has to be like the logo will have to be re redesigned at that point. So there are, there are pros for it. It's just, um, it's, de it's determining like what instances should you be using it for and then you know, design accordingly. If you make a logo for a, a movie or, you know, you make a movie and you want to put your own logo on there. I would do vectors. So here's different file formats. Uh, Illustrator.ai, that's what we're going to be using. Um, Affinity Designer is another type of uh, vector program, and I have only like touched it a couple times. I did a trial run at a business. They were um, interested in hiring me. It was for like a sign company, like manufacturing signs. Well, also designing, designing and manufacturing. Uh, and it was a pretty large business for being in a smaller town. And it's very similar, uh, Affinity Designer is very similar to Illustrator. It's like, well, why don't, you, why don't you just use Illustrator? Well, when you get out into the real world, you know, away from schools that just have all this extra money from tuitions just to like dump into industry standard program, um, you'll know that Adobe tax is like harsh. It's a, it's a harsh reality. Um, there's still probably a lot of businesses that are using like old Adobe software because they paid for it and they don't have a subscription fee. And why upgrade if it's working? So Affinity Designer is just a much more affordable price, especially if you have, you know, numerous computer stations. So anyhow, it, same principle though, right? We have vector points and those points are used to define the image. Postscript is basically the format that allows an image to withhold vector data. So just like we were to like export a JPEG or a PNG out of Photoshop, that becomes a raster image, right? It has all the pixels. Um, a postscript file allows you to embed that vector file data so that you can open that file in a plethora of different apps that support a postscript and you'll have in theory you'll have your your data um, so an example for that could be um, i'm trying to think if i 
what I gave him. I think it was an EPS, but either way, um, for doing uh, CNC, like milling, you know, a machine that it literally is just going like up, down, you know, left, right, back, forth. It's all on an X, Y axis. Uh, well, technically you could also have the Z axis, like how far you're drilling. That kind of system or like an embroidery machine, right? Anything that's really controlling um, where at in physical space could utilize a system like Vector. So PostScript is, is that ability to um, be more uh, program friendly, right? Kind of like traverse from one software program to another. Same, same sort of thing as an EPS, uh, which is an encapsulated PostScript. Um, basically has the same principles of withholding vector data, but with other, with other image components as well. And PDFs actually can hold PostScript vector data as well, if you enable it. Um, I've always stuck to the EPS format when, you know, sending an image to somebody and a vector image, and I want to retain the vector, um, the vectors for whatever I'm doing. I have always defaulted to the EPS because back when I started using content, EPS was the standard. I don't think PDF did. Um, and if it did, it might have been just like in its infancy of support. And so even if I did use a PDF to like say send to a printing company to print some postcards or something, um, well, a, a company probably would have access, but not everybody might not have like the same updated software that supports that newer version of PDF, right? There's, there's different versions um, of support. So, um, yeah, outside of Illustrator, uh, we will be covering like how to save as an EPS and uh, that's, that's usually what you would want to send to people if you don't I have know. a question. Sure. So I've done a lot of uh, CNC and like laser work. Uh, oh. It was with really old software though and it, you know, it didn't accept uh, .ai formats. Um, but it used uh, SVG, Scalable Vector Graphic Files, and I don't know if you've heard of those or anything, but... Uh, yeah, that's what I was sitting here thinking, like, what did I give... Um, uh, what did I give the, the faculty member? Because in the art department um, at UB, there's um, the sculpture technician, his name's Cristiano, and he was, funny enough, he was also my landlord. Um, he was, he's been trying to get a CNC machine in the uh, art department for years and never could convince them. So he ended up finally buying his own CNC machine and putting it in his own rented facility. And he ended up also buying like a, a metal, I, think, I don't know, metal CNC machine as well, do like one's uh, plasma cutting and the other is just like a wood, like for wood and vinyl and stuff like that. And he helped me cut a couple things for my thesis. And I don't remember what I gave him. I know it was a vector file. I just can't remember what format it was. Could have been, it could have been SV, uh, SVG. The, the thing about like Illustrator is in order to have a, a program support that, they have to pay the licensing fee. Right, and that's just added costs. So that's usually why everybody uh, defaults to those like free, more accessible, more interchangeable formats um, than the big ticket name holders. Uh, we'll still have the same kind of principles for color, um, obviously. 
We're not going to be printing again, obviously. Um, the one thing that we will be talking about once we get into next week is how we do have the ability to be a little bit more focused in on use of color. And this is the thing that I talk about quite frequently as a good way of understanding design is that the less content you have, kind of like a rule of thumb, the less content you have, the more critical that um, you know, gazing eyes will have on the content. So um, especially with that in mind, using different color theories can allow your, your content to really speak for itself or you're basically applying like another layer, like another system, another system of meaning towards your image. And there are different, a different couple ways of uh, managing color. As far as industry is concerned, um, color accuracy is a big thing, especially in, for, uh, in production. And uh, I mean, there's a number of examples, um, like a paint color for a car. You know, how do you get the same paint color for different cars, even though they might be produced in different years or different places? Um, or the same gallon of paint at a store, you paint half your room, you got to get the same one again, how does it match? Right, so you have um, libraries of color and those become system standards and um, uh, facilities, whatever they're using to print are calibrated quite meticulously so that they uphold those standards. And in Illustrator, um, we have the ability of accessing those standards and you know, using them. So even at an entry level graphic design position, for example, um, you might need to work within specific color, color branches or color libraries um, for your production because you know, maybe you're designing a t-shirt that needs to be printed in Japan or something, right? And how does, how do you know it's going to be accurate? So that you're like, well, what does it matter? Well, maybe we're also having the exact same logo color printed on shoes. You know, it's got to be a full outfit that matches and the shoes are going to be produced in Malaysia or something. And then once you get them all in America, is everything matching? that's the kind of intense standard that you've got to figure out. And that's one thing we have access to in Illustrator that's kind of more specific than Photoshop. Um, however, I, you know, never have had to use them myself, but I have went into the detail of, like this is an example of, you know, a Pantone subset. Pantones are pretty common from my understanding. Um, pretty common system, but, I, uh, I really use this color guide a ton in Illustrator because I, I really don't like going off and going on like websites and you know, the less windows I can have, the better. Um, as soon as I start getting more things opened, and, you know, I get sidetracked. So having the ability to manage your colors right inside of Illustrator is pretty helpful. Um, so we'll cover that too. It's like you're able to, select a base, you know, specific color that you want to be using. And then uh, maybe you can get complementary colors to that original color. And uh, then allow your image to be more cohesive towards this new, you know, this new structure of abiding by color theory. So uh, we'll cover, cover how to access that. And uh, this is getting into what I mentioned, the section on just different, different movements. Uh, it, it is a little bit, um, a little clumsy, I guess, especially if you've never really um, looked into any kinds of art history. Uh, if you 
you know, never really went to museums or art or history museums or um, understandable. And, you know, uh, I don't really need to cover this topic. I mean, the department never was like, hey, cover some art movements, right? But it is important in respect to knowing how we got to where we are and why design has become important and why we're focusing on it. So um, just kind of reflecting on how I presented it a few minutes ago. So time is it? Oh, we're doing way better on time. So in the current day, what do you guys think? Who pays for art? Uh, businesses? Sure. Yeah, businesses. Who else? Who pays for art? I mean, like general public, I, I suppose, is like somebody who wants something hanging on their wall. Consumers. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like museums and curators, stuff like that. Yeah. Anybody else? Maybe sometimes the city, like when they have paint murals or something around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if if they pay, if they pay, usually it's like wanting free labor. Um. Yeah, like ev everyone can pay for art. Right? There's not really a limitation. I mean, yeah, it, it could depend on what the art is and, and how many are available and, or even, you know, what is art, I guess. You know, you go to the store and there's a, there's a replicate, replicated painting. Is that art? Well, it's replicated. Is that really art? Did somebody actually draw it, paint it by hand? No. Yeah, the idea was there. Does it hold the same meaning? I don't know. To some people, maybe, right? So it's a, this is an important question because it, it kind of uh, starts to bring us back to like, well, is that how art always was? Is it, was it always, you know, meant for everyone? Like in history? No. You know, you look back, um, and I'm talking just a few hundred years. Um, man, even like even a hundred years, 150 years, definitely. Um, art, art wasn't for public. Not everybody could just go into a museum. Like, how many museums were there a hundred years ago? I mean, that's a valid question. I don't think very many, hand, handful, maybe like salon galleries kind of things. Um, so, you know, it was really for the elite, like ruling classes, kings, the church, right? People with power and money. And the interesting thing about that then is well, yeah, you're like, okay, well, yeah, they have the money. They could, they could pay for it. Okay. When you have the money to pay for whatever you want, are you just going to pay? For, are you just going to use your money for anything? Any, any one thing that's there that's available? Or are you going to opt for having exactly what you want? Probably the latter, right? You're going to have exactly what you want especially if you're willing to kill the people that are making this for you, right? So what ends up kind of coming into fruition is the fact that 
in the past, art was really a means of any other survival kind of form of, of production, right? If you're a farmer, you're, you're a smith, whatever, whatever it was, like you're really just producing to survive more so than it was to um, uh, produce things that are enjoyable for you and for friends and things that are your, that you're interested in more so. And, it, and it, I'm sure there's, you know, tons of people that would disagree with me. The point of the matter is though, is that any of that stuff that was created that was for anybody outside of um, the elite isn't really going to stand the test of time. It's not going to really be in a huge factor that's impacting society. It's um, the big, the big components of what art was is really based on the demand and the interest of those people that were in power which is pretty, pretty kind of like fucked up if you think about it, you know? Like if you imagine being back in that time, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of like rough to think about. It's kind of makes you uh, feel more appreciative, you know, of what, what we have now, but the, anyway, kind of stemming out of that realm of like, you know, only the people with money that, that can have power. Well, over time, there were revolutions. People, people were breaking down the systems at play, wanting more rights, you know, like finally banding together. Um, and this all came through, you know, evolution of our species in general, in a sense that like, we were trading more with other countries. We were finding better ways to live, you know, build housing. You know, as you progress in society, um, you, you kind of band together in different ways, right? And you find that, man, things are not, not good right now, right? So after, after those kinds of movements were established, you have things like artists creating artwork that's highlighting everyday people for everyday people rather than highlighting the elite for the elite. And it becomes um, also like a key factor in driving those, those movements, right? You're like influencing the movement itself. In, a, in, in essence. So this, this kind of sparked the, works like this sparked the modernistic, modern, uh, modern movement, modernism. Um, it was a time and era in history. And it really sought to like break down the traditional norms of like what art is. And um, this earlier type of art was really focused more on um, culture, society, um, still within the frame and context of traditional art. Like art is this painting and you have to be trained in this way. And, you know, there's a system and, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Um, it's kind of kind of trickled on for a time like that. Um, and, I, and I have a good kind of uh, quote here about modernism. It uh, affirms the power of human beings to make, improve, and reshape their environment with the aid of scientific knowledge, technology, and practical experimentation. So they have the ability to go out and experiment and try new things and take chances and not worry about getting their arm cut off or whatever it might be, you know? And so after time, as this evolved, um, 
not only was art made for small business owners, um, you know, uh, what the French would call the bourgeois, bourgeois, bourgeoisie, I can't even say it, um, kind of like the new middle class, right? This new class standard came out and um, all of a sudden, more ordinary people had the ability at buying things they wanted, right? Not, not just what the elite wanted. Well, for an artist, that's still along the lines of like, oh, well, I'm still producing for, you know, people, not my interest per se. However, as time went on, more and more people were able to do that. All of a sudden, the, the status of an artist became a viable occupation to be able to like, you know, produce a living through their art. Not everyone, not all the time, still like all, art has always been a struggle, but it brings out that notion of like, oh, well now artists have the ability of uh, experimenting and seeing what else they could do with different thoughts and different um, ideas that they have kind of came up with, especially like talking with other artists that, you know, also have these different interests and um, art's always been that kind of component through history that is always seeking something new. It's always trying to, 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 to challenge itself and um, not be so repetitive, you know, like doing something that's not been done before. So this um, name everybody is familiar with and um, he did a lot of different types of work, but uh, this one in particular is like, considered the first cubist um, painting. And cubism is a whole movement, one of the big movements of modernism that was under this principle of drawing a three-dimensional image or figure on a two-dimensional surface, right? Multiple perspectives of the same thing on one substrate. Sounds like, oh yeah, okay, I get that, or whatever. You know, 100 years ago, that was still a pretty radical concept, right? And needed to see various iterations of how that worked and wrap your head around the concept. And, you know, these just kept evolving over time. And after more and more artists came into this sphere of influence and were producing, obviously there was some that were better than others. And then all of a sudden you need a new outlet, right? So there, there was a lot of branches that came off of this. And over time, what needed to happen was um, the way in which artists learned had to change, right? It can't keep just happening off the same system of, say, um, traditional artists. You know, there's still traditional art programs in the world. and uh, some of them are like you go to school for four or three years and you learn to draw. You're drawing three years. You're drawing. You're drawing. Fourth year. Okay, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be a sculptor. Okay, you can go ahead and sculpt. You had to go through that whole process of learning the basic, learning history, going through the motions, right? You had to be part of the club to be like affirmed that you're like this artist, that you're able to do something. Well, um, this guy, Walter Gropius, he was an architect in Germany. He came up with this concept that, um, art school doesn't need to be like that. Outside influences are welcome. And thus he designed this Bauhaus school that allowed, uh, originally it was architecture, design, um, some principles of engineering or science and uh, art, all kind of all in one building, all people fusing together their ideas towards like common goals, creating new things. And um, this is still the way in which most like full blown art schools are designed. Um, here at UB, 
Um, I mean, I even went through the art department, so I have a good sense of how it's not totally like a Bauhaus kind of structure. I mean, it's got elements, but um, the point of it is to bring all these different people together to focus on art. And where here is um, the art, the, at least the art department in UB, uh, because it's a public school and anybody can take the art, uh, the problem ends up being that nobody's really interested in developing within that field. They're just interested in getting a taste of what's to offer, right? Oh, I'm gonna take a painting class because that sounds like fun. Not like, oh, I wanna take this painting class because you know I'm a mathematician and I think that I could really create some really interesting artwork based on these principles that I learned or, you know, and then co collaborate with, uh, you know, an engineer or something. And so um, that's kind of more in a private school setting. You have more of that uh, interconnection with other departments, but, um, or in the, at the graduate level in general. So coming out of, out of that whole era of like trying new things, um, this was when, um, 60s, 70s, this whole structuralism movement came out, kind of starting to form the basis of like more contemporary design and setting this precedence that, um, there's a whole, there's like structure behind all things and really setting, kind of setting up these almost barriers, like systems to understand the world. And this is just one example here, how there's no language behind language, right? Like if you're gonna describe what language is to me, you have to use language. There's nothing like at a lower level, right? And that like, that, that thought in itself is like a way of structuring what language is, right? It's the base level of like communication. So um, that went on for a number of years. And then there's post-structuralism movement that came out as well. Obviously this image is earlier than that, but the whole point, this is a good example that's used, is that post-structuralism was kind of like this effort to undermine and strip down and challenge what structuralism was and really kind of make uh, strong affirmations. And this is a painting uh, and it says, this is not a pipe, right? What's interesting about this? Anybody? I mean, the, the image itself is a pipe, but I, is it trying to get more so at like the fact that what you're looking at is more so it's, it's a painting overall sort of thing. Yeah. And really, this is a this is a painting of a pipe that you're looking at through light, through like a re reproduction of a painting of a pipe, right? That's like a third tier in, so to speak. It's kind of getting at like what is the real systems? How are they really there? Um, some of it's very very jarring, like like, I don't know, like dad joke bad, you know, but. Um, then we get into postmodernism, literally uh, challenging again, but this time challenging uh, modernism itself. Uh, began sometime in the 70s. Um, kind of promoted movements such as intermedia, right? Like multimedia, this combination of different types of forms. Um, using light and sound, that sort of thing. Uh, conceptual art and installation art. Um, and again, this isn't to get confused of like, I don't know if I mentioned this in the first one, um, like modernism isn't really supposed to mean like the modern era. It's literally like a time in history, modernism. Um, same thing with postmodernism. It's not like, after what's currently happening, 
Um, it literally just means like after modernism, which, you know, has ended. Postmodernism has ended, right? It's a kind of a snapshot in history, which is always interesting to kind of think back on. But what's also interesting is like, well, we're living in an era too that doesn't yet have a name, but at some point, somebody studying this time will like develop a name. You know, it's kind of an interesting, like, oh, what is our era? What is, what is it going to be with all of the 90s and 80s and 90s and 2000s crap? Um, oh, by the way, if anybody um, is able to go, um, there's a Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. It's pretty, it's pretty nice. A few different... Uh, Nice places in Pittsburgh. Um, going on from this, there is like a question on your quiz, FYI, about this. Um, I don't even know, like I just kind of set this as, um, set this up based on somebody else's guidelines they gave me, so I just left it, but um, kind of thinking about these two different forms of language grammar and vocabulary. And so thinking about the basic components of say a drawing, like really what are the basic things? Well, that's kind of like the overall vocabulary, right? If you're kind of like forming a sentence, you need words. These are like those vocab words. And grammar is like, how are you structuring that into a larger piece? Um, how are you, you're using movement between the different components? You're emphasizing one component from another component, right? Um, so grammar and vocab. And um, have some examples here. Oops, I already went past one. This one here is like a, an example of uh, balance, where at the top we have um, an an interesting kind of more formal way of balancing uh, type with imagery and information, right? If everything's centered, everything's named, you know, all the information's there. It's very straightforward. Together we can save a life. Here's the number, like help us, right? The lower one, not so straightforward. It's not very centered, it's actually cut off, but it still has a balance, right? This whole symbol is, there's a balance there. So there's still meaning, I'm, I'm sure there's still like write, writing at the bottom that's influencing what it's doing, but. Uh, another example, this one is, um, I believe kind of emphasis more so, in the sense that, um, no, like unity, harmony, perhaps, right? Everything's around a guitar and playing guitar and what you need for playing guitar. Movement, right? You have things like looking like they are falling down and it reads. Notice we have type here, right? Type and type is over here and it's being cut out around the letter or letters are being kind of pushed away. This is kind of um, uh, like layout design, right? Financial solutions as varied as your needs. So they're using the word varied quite literally like there's multiple flavors and they're showing you all the variety, right? And it's through the sense of movement. Um, and then I think another one here, uh, proportion, right? A dandelion doesn't look that large. I kind of get the gist of this. Um, obviously, everybody knows what color is. Everybody knows what texture is. Uh, <clears throat> spacing. Um, I don't even know what that means. Why is this even on here? Spacing, mono, or proportional? I think I've like 
blown past a lot of these things for so long that I don't even like look at them anymore. Um, uh, serif, sans serif. This is like uh, different types of fonts. There's two like main classifications of fonts. Um, well, I guess may maybe there could be like a third. Um, like serif, sans serif, and yeah, script. Well, apparently there, if that's the case, then there's also display fonts. I'd have a hard time grasping what that really means. Like good for display. There is, there is typefaces that are good for display, but however, they're still going to have a script or, or they're still going to have a serif or a sans serif. So I don't know. I don't know. Main things are um, serif, sans serif. So these are like the little uh, serifs are like the little uh, like notches or are little like swirly bits at the end edges of um, letter forms. Uh, and you'll see once you watch Helvetica, that'll become pretty evident, and we'll talk about it on Monday. But um, we have weight, different terms, um, points. Point size is a very big thing, um, <clears throat> like 10 point font, 24 point font. Same thing with spacing. What's your points size and spacing? Um, your uh, body size, X height. Oh, um, in terms of like <clears throat> how high the letter forms are rising. How far do they ascend upward and and uh, down? So some letter, some typefaces are, you know, very tall and slender. Uh, letting and kerning. These are technical terms to talk about a little bit, but <clears throat> essentially these are. Um, letting is like the space in between lines. Like so, in the in the past, traditionally. Uh, like new, you know, printing newspapers, anything before digital, when you print like text onto a page, it was all done with lead type. It was like hand carved out originally, it was hand carved out of lead. And then each letter was a separate piece of lead type. And they're all arranged and accumulated together, like bounded together. And then ink was rolled on it, right? And then it was printed. So they had to have a system of separating the letters if they wanted more space, a system of separating the lines of type or the lines of, um, uh, uh, yeah, like your lines of your paragraph or something, right? And so the letting is literally the space in between your lines and the kerning is your space in between your letter forms. And so, um, baseline is like the line literally that your letters are sitting on top of, like when you're elementary school learning how to, you know, draw letters. And uh, ligatures are a combination of letter forms. So, like, Amer I think American Eagle, like, uses it for their logo, right? AE. It's like any kind of letters that overlap one another. Even if you don't mean them to overlap, it's still considered a ligature. So, but there are actual formed ligatures that do have um, some meaning to them. And last thing I will, will mention here is that um, this program, just like Photoshop, except Photoshop, we weren't really using type. If you save an Illustrator file that has type in it, you send it to somebody else and they don't have that type, they're not gonna be able to read the image the same way. It'll like default some other type and it won't look the same. So ways to get around this are, and like 50% of people miss this, so you can perk your ears up right there. Um, and I'll cover this several more times, but um, so when you, before you submit, you're gonna to have to expand all of your type. And we're gonna go over what that means. But it's basically like when you have a text box and you're typing in a program, right? 
it comes up as type. You can highlight it. You can type new words. You can change the font size. You can, you know, change whatever you want, right? It's type. Well, you need to transform that into objects, into vectors. And then once you send it to me, it's no longer type. There's no problem with losing the file, like the type, the type, um, uh, the font. Or you could quite literally take the font and put it in the same folder as your file. And then all of a sudden, I have the ability of installing that font on my computer, and thus I can see your image as it should be, right? So um, I'll show this to you on Monday as well. Fontbook is an app on Mac computers. Uh, it's native. You don't have to install it. Anytime you want a new font, you say go on the web and download it, whether it's free or you pay for it, and you just drag and drop it into Fontbook, and all of a sudden it should be available on every program on the computer. So um, that's it. Anybody have questions? I, my jaw is tired from so much talking today. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Did you say that the blog post for the it's Helvetica not... is due Friday? Yeah, I I haven't even put it up yet, but okay. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, just because I'm I was procrastinating on it. Like all the content exists. It's just a matter of like rerouting it so you guys have it. It's kind of it's kind of annoying. But that's what I get for having my own website. So you know. Um but yeah, I mean it'll take you time time to like sit down and watch the movie anyway. Um, it's very, it's very general questions like, you know, what's one thing about type that you didn't know before and whatever. Um, I'll, I'll get it done tonight for sure. And then um, it'll be on there. And I'll probably send out an email reminder tomorrow. Like, oh, hey, things are updated, you know, schedule's updated, whatever. Um, Yeah, so since we're gonna be doing like a couple different projects at once, this will be a, a time for you guys to, um, you know, multitask, like manage the, manage the workload on your own, on your own time. Uh, it's, it's time to make it or break it. Let's see, we have to cover the project page here. So, uh, this project again is focusing on type. Um, it's very open, just like the first project. So, happy days. There is one caveat that I always give to people uh, because, you know, we're all stressed out enough. Um, I'll go into this. You guys can read most of this, but um, the assignment, design a work that speaks out on an issue of involving politics and technology. Number one thing, everybody always thinks and defaults to like American politics and half the, half the projects end up being about Trump and Twitter. Uh, I really don't, want any of you to be focusing on that unless you have like a really good reason like you know you're part of a some kind of public public movement on something and you need posters or you know something to print out and hand out and like there's some additional meaning towards it if you're if you're in the boat of a lot of other people and you're just kind of you're like feeling like angry and frustrated and divided because of like, that's what American politics is doing right now. 
Um, there's probably other things to be focusing on that might be a little bit more like positive, not so, uh, you know, not so um, negative. So I urge you guys all to think beyond the, the primary components on that and really think maybe first, like maybe first pick the technology, right? And think of like, well, what kind of, what kind of tech do I want to focus on? Is it like, you know, uh, just like the first movie or the first video we watch, technology is everything. Medicine, hammers, uh, I don't, you know, everything, everything's technology. It doesn't have to be digital technology or, you know. And if I don't preface this, then I get like, you know, 10 VR projects or something, right? It's like, try to think outside the box. Um, and I'm not saying don't do VR, but it's like finding something you're interested in enough to do a project on rather than just like, oh, I have to do this project, so I'm picking this thing. It's, it's open-ended for that reason, so you guys find interest. And it's not that you have to know everything about the topic. Uh, this project is really designed so you find something that you have interest in, and then we're gonna like, you know, research it to some extent and figure out like, what are the components of it? Why does it matter? You know, um, and then you're applying some kind of level of politics to it in a way to delve deeper into, into it. And so that ends up being, that could be several levels. Like, are you creating this image to protest it? Are you, are you creating an image to claim favor to one, one element of it, right? Um, politics is really just pointing out that there's multiple perspectives and um, you could quite literally just show both sides. You don't even have to take sides, right? Um, you know, you show a picture of a person, they have like, uh, like a demon on their one shoulder and an angel on the other. And the title is like, which do you choose, right? It's like, that's some level of politics, but you're not really investing your opinion into it. So there's, you can kind of go any way with this, um, but I, I wanna just really be clear that you don't need to all be focusing on American politics just because uh, that's all you kind of get these days, right? It's like kind of expanding your horizon a bit. Um, another thing to be focusing on is what particular element of a said category could you focus on rather than like, you know, oh, I'm doing my project on the internet. What? Like that, that's not even really like, how do you even, how do you portray that or like, that's a, that's a huge task, right? But instead, maybe you could be focusing on like, um, who controls our access to the internet or something like that. And then it's more like on, you know, media company or like cable provider companies or something. And are they tracking your, you know, is it about data tracking? Is it about, there's so many different levels you can go in and your task first of all is going to be honing in and figuring out that just like the first project develop this statement this proposal what are you doing um and based on that then you can start doing your sketches then we'll meet again in person to talk about everything um, that'll be next Wednesday. So a week from today, we'll be discussing sketches. Um, the only thing that I'm going to be focusing on, and, and not only thing, but the, again, the thing to keep in mind is that because we're using type, we should be able to read the image, right? You're literally able to like 
put bits and pieces of your statement on the image. So in the end, your image should realistically convey everything that you're saying in your statement, like through the image. And not by specifically just like writing a paragraph and we just read the, like that's not what it's about. It's like creating a visual hierarchy that we can go through and read this image um, and kind of understand what's happening based on, you know, what you're presenting to us. So uh, text is images, like the one big thing I'll be uh, making sure you guys are uh, abiding by. Um, anything else? So this is kind of like what I'll be having for your post, like your um, concept, is kind of asking yourself these questions like, who's your client? You know, is this for kids? Is it for, um, I don't know, is it for low income families? Is it for, commuters, you know, kind of like basing, basing your technology and the politics around like, who's this, who's this affecting? And I guess the answer should be like, it should be, it should be abiding to people that the content matters for, you know, like, um, if it's, like pollution, uh, like uh, ocean pollution. Um, maybe this is probably then based on like, um, the audience would be maybe young adults or something and like trying to get them on board of like changing society and how we process waste and right. Like, why are you making this? Why is it meaningful? You know figuring out a reason for what you're doing. Um, that's kind of like, you know, part, part of the uh, um, development, development phase is really locking down these questions. Because once you have answered these questions, you set it in stone, it's like everything follows through. Just like, I would imagine after you went through that first project, you kind of get an understanding of like how going through that step by step allowed you to come to like, you know, where you're at now a lot easier than it would if you were just like, here's Photoshop, here's some tools, make something, you know? So, um, there's other stuff on here. Oh, my scroll wheel is dirty. Um, I'll get the rubric on here too. It's pretty similar to the first one. Uh, and then different examples. So like, I'll just open wired cause I haven't opened it up for a while. And, um, so if we click on like any of these, any of these links here, let's see if, uh, we have an article or not. Mm, we do, but it's like a web article. It's not like a layout design article. Hmm. Well, you know, while we're here, I might just uh, sign up for a trial real quick because I haven't done it. And um, does anybody have questions on the project? Oh, I think I could do it right on my phone.
You guys want to hear a sweet story? So yesterday I woke up and I'm like, oh, I got to do work. So naturally I just left the house and didn't come back until the evening. So I went out and I returned a phone case that I didn't like at Apple. And because my, my older case was like, I don't know if anybody has an iPhone, but at the base uh, ends up like peeling in the same spots on like all phones. And uh, I know this also because I worked there and I've seen it like a million times. Um, and so I went in and I was thinking, oh man, you know what? Instead of buying another one of these, I'm gonna see if like I can just get it replaced because technically it kind of could, could have been replaced. Like if I were doing that session and somebody gave it to me, I'd be like, well, not really, but okay, we'll do it for you. You know, I'll tell them like, oh, we'll do it for you this time. And luckily for me, I know what the procedure is because I've, I've worked there and I've read the procedure. So it states that any damage is not covered. If the, if the thing is damaged, it's accessory, it's not covered under a one-year warranty. However, I had a few things on the case that were covered, such as peeling, very tiny little peel spots. But it wasn't damage, it was peeling. And the article specifies that anything that's factory defect takes precedence over any damage and the, the damage is nullified. So in effect, even though I had damage, I was like, well, because the guy checking me in is like, well, I don't think that's covered. And I'm like, well, I worked here and I can tell you. And I told him that. And he's like, oh, let me go ask. And he went to ask his manager. And it's like, that manager was one of my managers. And he's just like, oh, hey. And I'm like, yeah, we'll do it for you. Because like, I, I already know what's going on. It was pretty, pretty nice to have a fresh, new, free, sticking it to the man kind of, a, kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, anywho, anyway. Nobody has any questions. I like rambled for over an hour. Come on, somebody give me something. All right. Well, I think you guys know what you got going on for the weekend here. And... Yeah, if anybody wants to stick around for Project One help, um, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. Um, or if you, you know, even if you like can't remember what your question was, throw up in Photoshop and play around and, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like work session for a few minutes. So otherwise everybody else is good to go. So uh, if you're not sticking around, have a good weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good weekend. I just have a quick question. Are we submitting the final assignment on the Facebook page or in UBLearns? Um, I think somewhere I mentioned um, that it'd be nice if you guys posted like a final version on your original post on Facebook. I, I'm not grading that. That's not a that's not a thing. That's just like a social element, I guess. But um yeah, the the final statement is all on Google Drive. Or sorry, the final um um submission. So if we go here and we look at project one. The shared drive, right? Yep. So under the project one page, if we scroll down, there should be um, a section four submission. So under the correct Google Drive folder, create a folder with your name and upload these four different things. Um, so as long as you know how to make like a press quality PDF, I don't even know I don't even know if we, we actually covered that. I don't think we did. 
um, just a text file for your like final statement and then um, save for web. I know we covered save for web. So yeah, yeah as long as you remember that. The um, press quality PDF is like literally when you go to save as, you select PDF and then when you hit save, uh, a second dialog box comes up and then at the very top of that, you have preset options. And one of the presets is called press quality. Um, so it just makes it like lower file size while retaining quality, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, well, unless I walk through it or tell you, like you might you probably won't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I'll try to, yeah, if you, if you can too, try to remind me, I'll, I'll put a note, but um, that'd be good to tell the class on Monday. All right. I'll, if anything, I'll just email it. Well, I'll email you about it before I turn in the um, Friday assignment. Cool. All right. So thank you. Have a well, good day. You too.